Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know about a new book from tonight's author, T.W. Grimm. T.W. Grimm brings us a different kind of magic, available now on Amazon, in the link in the description down below. Magic, often seen as wondrous and benevolent, but T.W. Grimm, a celebrated author of eerie no-sleep tales, offers a different kind of sorcery, one that pulls at the very threads of reality, weaving tales of terror and wonder. If you want to check out a different kind of magic, check the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Now, my only connection to the real world was through the attic windows. I would spend hours looking at the sky and watching clouds float by. Mama said I couldn't go outside because I would scare people. And people were dangerous when they were scared. I asked her why people would be so scared of how I look. And she answered, because you're different. The woman in black laughed bitterly and took another sip from her flask. Sometimes I'd see other children playing outside. I have no idea they were my own brother and sister. Mama never told me about them, or father, or about virtually anything that happened beyond the walls of the attic. All I knew was there was other kids out there, and I wanted to meet them so Badly, it actually hurt. Whenever I saw them down there, I'd beg to go outside until I was in tears, but the answer was always no. They said the other kids would cry and run away from me. Couldn't understand why they would do that, when all I wanted was to run and laugh with them in the sunshine. I cried over it many times. I could have filled an ocean. It was hard on Mama to see me get so worked up. But what was she going to tell me? I was too young to grasp the situation. All she could say was that I was too different to play with the other children. Someone would probably get hurt. And she was right. Henry watched intently as Delilah fished something out of a hidden pocket. His hand, ready at the grip of his revolver, it was a folding fan that was embossed with the same serpentine shape that was tattooed on the back of Diego's hand. She waved some tepid air under her veil and exclaimed, Goodness! Certainly a lot warmer up here than I'd expect at this time of year. It's plenty hot down my way, but don't get me wrong, but it's a dry sort of heat. More like a blast furnace. Less like a vegetable steamer, if you know what I mean. Feels like I'm swimming through the air. It's absolutely horrid. Henry's hand drifted away from his gun. He smiled a little and said, The humidity can just about drive you nuts sometimes. You're right, though. Then you usually get this warm in late October. Having ourselves a dry-ass summer this year. Not ready to pack its bags and go. Not quite yet. I nodded along with Henry and said, Yes, ma'am, the heat's a different sort of beast entirely when it's coupled with the humidity. Different sort of beast entirely, though I repeated in a wooden tone. As I said, Mama was right. I was different from the other children. I found out just how different on Charlie's 10th birthday. I peeked out the window one morning and saw a whole bunch of people setting up tables on the grass. A couple of men were putting together a big metal framework of some kind, and another man was filling balloons with a tank of helium. Everywhere I looked, people were putting up lights and hanging up streamers. I'd never seen such a spectacle before, never in all my seven years of life up in the attic. I was so excited, I couldn't stop jumping up and down and giggling like a little maniac. There were so many colors. I asked Mama what was happening down there, and her eyes got really sad. She sat me down and explained to me that it might look like a lot of fun from the safety of the attic, but it was very dangerous. She told me, there's a lot of people out there today, so you'd better stay away from the windows. If someone saw you, they might start asking questions. I was so, so crushed that I couldn't watch through the windows, Delilah sighed. I ran to my bed and I cried so hard I ended up crying myself to sleep. When I woke up, Mama was sleeping beside me on the bed. She was completely zonked out on her pain pills. Mama always called them her vitamins, but they would make her act slow and tired. Sometimes she would lie down in the middle of the day and sleep like the dead. They definitely weren't vitamins. Anyhow, I slept out of bed and I tiptoed over to the bedroom window. 
I probably could have banged two frying pans together beside her head and not wake her up. But I tiptoed because I knew I was about to do something bad. I thought, just one peek, and that's it. One peek won't hurt anything. I saw dozens of people eating and drinking at the tables, and I could hear calliope music in the background. A clown was wandering through the crowd on a pair of stilts, and they even had a merry-go-round set up under a huge tent. I drank it all in like a girl dying of thirst. The colors and the sounds and the, the people and the laughter. I drank it all in, and then I drank some more, and I, I was completely transfixed. And then I saw him strolling through the crowds. The birthday boy himself. I recognized him as one of the kids that I would see playing out in the yard. I watched him stroll through the milling crowd, getting handshakes and pats on the shoulder everywhere he went, and I pressed myself up close to the glass. If only I could be down there amongst all those happy people, just smiling and eating and laughing away like anyone else. I wanted a piece of cake. And a ride on the merry-go-round. I needed it. The boy in the suit shaded his eyes and craned his neck to look up, and I realized he could see me standing in the window. My heart jumped in my chest and I almost ran away, but I did a very bad thing instead. A thing I was told to never, ever do, but I went and I did it anyway. I waved at him to get his attention. Delilah sounded like she was struggling not to cry. She cleared her throat and said, My apologies, gentlemen. It can be very difficult to talk about traumatic events, even if they happened long in the past. Those old scars can still tear open, can't they? Yes, they certainly can. Anyway, Charlie saw me waving at him, and he looked around at all the grown-ups standing nearby, but he didn't tell anyone. Instead, he headed for the front entrance. As soon as I realized he was coming up to the attic, I felt the most awful wave of panic wash over me. I hid behind a bunch of wooden crates on the far side of the attic. What if he was scared of me and ran away, just like Mama always said he would? What if he just plain didn't like me? The very thought made me want to shrivel up and disappear. I wouldn't be able to bear it. Of course, I knew... I should just keep my mouth shut and hide until he was gone, but I was lonely and little and so, so sad all the time. I just wanted to go outside and run with him in the sunshine. That's all I wanted in the whole wide world. So I gathered up my courage, took a deep breath, and I called out to her. Hi. Happy birthday. Poor Charlie just about jumped out of his skin. He whirled around and he yelped, Who's there? I came out from behind the crates and goodness, my tiny heart was racing a million miles an hour in my chest. I raised my hand and I squeaked, Hi, I'm Delilah. Charlie turned just as pale as cream and asked if I was a ghost. I told him I didn't think so, but I didn't know what a ghost was, so I wasn't really sure. He walked up to me slowly, real cautious-like, and he asked, How long have you been living in the attic? How do you get up here? I said, I don't know. I guess I've always been here. Charlie still wasn't sure if I was a ghost or not, but curiosity had gotten the better of him. He told me his name and said that he lived downstairs with his family. Well, I never even suspected there was anyone below us, so I was completely shocked. He gave me a funny look and said, Do you know what this place is? It's a cat house. Delilah chuckled at this point, sipping at her mystery drink. She said, I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought he meant it was a house full of cats. I didn't care either way because it was amazing to be talking to someone new. Remember, I had only ever spoken with two other people in my entire life. I started asking him a million questions, but he shushed me and said, How come you're wearing that thing on your head? He was talking about my veil, of course. All of a sudden, I got really, really scared. I tried to shrug it off like it was no big deal, and I told him, Mama said I have to wear it. I wanted to just leave it at that, but he kept pestering me about it. I was getting more and more flustered, and finally I just told him, Nanny doesn't like to see my face. Charlie stared at me for a second, and then 
he started smirking to himself. He was only ten years old, but that was old enough to put two and two together. Is there something wrong with your face? Is that why they're hiding you up here? Let me see. I denied there was anything wrong with me, and Charlie said, Yeah, right. You don't even know who you are, do you? Everyone thinks you died when you were a baby. Come on, let me see your face. Well? Delilah said quietly. Charlie got what he wanted. He snatched the veil off my head, and that mean laughter of his instantly turned into a scream. I tried to calm him down, but I didn't think that he could hear me over his own hollering. He grabbed an old wooden cane out of an open crate and whacked me over the head with it. My word, it hurt like the dickens. I started screaming right along with him. He kept whacking me with that cane and yelling all kinds of awful things. I was calling for Mama to come save me, but those painkillers had her floating around in the clouds somewhere. She didn't hear a thing. Charlie cornered me and laid into me with that cane. At this point, it wasn't fear reaction anymore, and it was loathing. He saw something that offended him on a primal level, and he wanted to destroy it. I was curled up in a ball, blubbering at him to stop, and then... Something came over me. Delilah trailed off as if she were uncertain if it were wise to continue. Harry said in a gentle tone, There are certain places where it feels natural to unload your secrets. Bar rooms, confession booths, bedroom. Heck, people do it on the internet all the time. This farm is one of those places. A lot of secrets have been told right here where we're sitting. More than you'd believe. <laughs> you travel all this way out here to tell us yours. Go ahead. Unburden yourself. Your secrets will stay right here with us. And the rest will. Delilah shifted uncomfortably in her chair and said, Well, something came over me. I saw red. And just like that, I wasn't scared or hurt anymore. I was white hot, blazing furious. I dodged another swing from that cane and slammed into him like a rocket. We fell onto the floor and I bit him. I coiled up and I struck just like a... Delilah let the last word die in her tongue. I could feel that wicked grin radiating beneath her veil again. I had the distinct feeling this particular memory wasn't actually difficult for her at all. She enjoyed it, I thought, her poisonous smile, and it made me feel profoundly uncomfortable. She took another sip from her flask and said, Charlie's whole body went stiff as a board. His cheeks started turning black. It spread across his face, and he started swelling up like one of those party balloons. I realized what I had just done, and I just about fell apart. I ran into the bedroom and I started screaming directly into Mama's face to wake her up. I jumped up and down on the bed until she finally rolled over and slurred, Where's your veil, honey? Why aren't you wearing your veil? I was too... I was too hysterical to make any sense. So I just grabbed her hand and pulled until she followed me. When she saw Charlie's body, she made this horrible sound and yanked her hand away from mine. Charlie was swollen up so bad, all of his shirt buttons were popped off. His skin was purple and black all over. He looked like a rotten old melon. I couldn't hardly even recognize him as a human being anymore. Mama crumpled down beside him and yelled, What did you do? What did you do to your brother? It hit me then. It all hit me like a clap of thunder and suddenly I understood. I truly was a monster, and there could never be a place for me in this world. It would always come down to destroy or be destroyed, always. Mama looked up at me and shrieked, I told you this would happen, didn't I? She grabbed me by the front of my dress and shook me like a rag doll. She cursed me until she was gasping for breath, and then she started to cry. I sat down on the floor beside her and we cried together for a while, me and Mama. 
the only person who had ever truly loved me. Henry wiped a film of sweat off of his forehead with the sleeve of his work shirt and murmured, God Almighty, what an awful tragedy. I can't even imagine. Delilah squeezed her hands together in her lap and snorted. Told you already, big brother, God wasn't there. To be quite frank, I don't think God was anywhere. If he was, how would he allow such a thing to happen? Delilah paused and waited for a response. Henry shook his head and muttered, I don't really have an answer for that. It's a damn good question, isn't it? In a distant, musing tone, Delilah asked, No one's heard from him in a long time, have they? A lot of folks are searching for something new to fill that void in their hearts. Isn't that right, Diego? Diego snapped to attention and vigorously shook his head in agreement. He sat up straight and chanted, I follow the word of the madam. I am her will made flesh. I felt an odd chill run up my spine at the evangelical lilt in his voice. Henry raised his eyebrows and said, I see. Well, long as you're happy, I suppose. What do you say, kid? You happy? Delilah pointedly cleared her throat, and Diego quickly slumped back into his chair and looked down at his lap to avoid eye contact with Uncle Henry and nervously fidgeted at his pants. He was already on his madam's shit list today. He didn't want to risk incurring any more of her wrath. She said, I think your nephew is right, Henry. You do have a bad habit of derailing the conversation. Anyhow, as I was saying, Charlie's... His unfortunate accident was very bad news for poor little me. Mama had to get me out of there before Father found out. She rang the bell to summon the nanny and started tossing all my dirty clothes out of the laundry hamper. She said, We have to get you out of here right now, baby. He's going to kill you. I asked, Who? Who will kill me? And she answered, Your father. He'll kill you and he'll kill me too. Get in the hamper. When the nanny saw Charlie, she staggered back and almost fainted. Mama caught her before she fell and eased her onto the floor. Nanny crossed herself and said, Oh my dear God, they're looking for him right now. Your husband will murder her on the spot. Mama snapped back, Not if he doesn't catch her. She made me curl up in the bottom of the hamper and packed a bunch of dirty laundry on top of me. They dragged me onto the dumbwaiter that brought up food from the kitchen and clothes from the laundry room. Mama told me, we're going to lower you all the way down to the basement, darling. Just wait there in the hamper and don't make a sound, okay? I'll be down as soon as I can. I was so, so afraid, Lila murmured softly. I couldn't imagine what might happen to me next. As Mama started lowering the platform, I heard Nanny say, Have you lost your mind, woman? Where's she gonna go? No one will ever take her in. She was wrong, though, Delilah purred, and the flask disappeared beneath her veil for another sip. That shriveled up old prune, she was dead wrong about that one. Now, Henry, this is a bit off topic, but I understand you recently sold your farm. Is that so? Henry pursed his lips and grudgingly said, Yeah, I did. Sold it for a fair price to a couple from the city. They're looking to escape the rat race or something, I don't know. My neighbor over on the next concession, Jonathan, is going to work the land for a share of the profit. And if there is any profit, sometimes the margins can be awful slim. Delilah nodded thoughtfully and said, It's a shame the farm couldn't have stayed in the family. I believe our nephew here feels the same way, don't you? Her words were like a sly sucker punch to the kidney. I grimaced and said, It wasn't the right time for us to buy. I was disappointed, but it is what it is. Oh my, yes, timing's everything, Delilah agreed. And funding, of course. If you lack the funds to close the deal yourself, well. Delilah trailed off and sipped away at her mystery drink. I felt my face flush red and I gritted my teeth. Delilah was undoubtedly a tragic figure, but she was also an antagonistic asshole of a human being. She used her words like a whip, splitting skin so she could lap up the misery that trickled from the wounds. 
Well, I suppose I should amend that statement. She was a being of some kind, but I'm not sure if human is the right term for someone who is afflicted with the Medusa disorder. And honestly, I'm not sure if afflicted is the right word either. Delilah leaned forward and waited for my rebuttal, eager for an opportunity to needle someone for her amusement. I remained silent, so she reclined back into her chair with an air of subtle disappointment and continued her story. No one at the party saw Charlie go inside. They all figured that he wandered out into the scrub land and got lost. Everyone was out there searching for him, even the laundry crew, so the laundry room was dark and empty. I lay in that hamper for what seemed like ages before I heard footsteps on the concrete floor. It was Mama and the nanny. Mama whispered, we're going to get you out of here, sugar. Just lie still and hush. They put the hamper on a laundry cart and started wheeling me over to the service bay. And just then a man's voice called out, Hello, ladies, if you don't mind me asking, what are you doing down here? Mama let out a yelp and said, Oh, you scared me, Saul. What are you doing down here? He answered, I'm looking for your boy, madam. In fact, just about everyone's looking for your boy. Everyone except you. There was a thick silence. And then Mama told him, I'm sure he's just out wandering, Saul. That's what kids do. They explore their environment. You could hear the raw emotion in her voice. She wasn't fooling anyone, let alone one of her husband's cutthroats. He said, I went up to the attic, I saw what happened. That she devil of yours, that circus freak. She in that hamper? Huh? Are you trying to smuggle her out of here? Mama started to deny it, but Nanny spoke up and said, I'm so sorry. She forced me to help her. I wasn't even there when it happened. I swear it's true. Mama growled, you nasty old bitch. And I heard a loud smack. There was the sound of a struggle and Mama shrieked, stay away from her. Don't you hurt her. I heard another smack louder this time and Mama cried out in pain. The man yelled, stay down. And a big hand and a rubber glove hauled me out by my arm. I found myself staring at a mean-looking thug with a crooked nose and a scar up his lip. He looked down at me with absolute horror in his eyes as he whispered, Sweet mother of God, how could you let this thing live? Mama was lying on the floor with her eyes swelling shut. She pushed herself up with her arms and screeched, Get him, baby! He wants to hurt you! He's a bad man! Oh, Delilah crooned and her hands clenched tightly around the flask. Oh, the horrible rage I felt when I saw what he did to Mama's poor, sweet face. I went absolutely wild. He tried to shove me away and pull out his gun, but I was too fast. I sank my teeth into his neck, and he went down like a ton of bricks. Nanny screamed and turned to run, but the old croon tripped over her own feet. She hit her head on a folding table on the way down and started to crawl away. Mama pointed at Nanny's retreating backside and groaned. She'll tell them everything, baby. You have to stop her. Delilah sipped from her flask in an air of deep satisfaction. In a matter-of-fact tone, she said, I understood what had to be done. I came after Nanny with blood on my teeth and murder in my heart. She swore she wouldn't tell anyone, but I knew it was a lie. So I silenced her. There was another uncomfortable silence. Dense and oppressive. Henry wiped a fresh film of sweat off of his face with his sleeve and murmured, Good Christ, I don't even know what to say to that. He grabbed a fresh can out of the cooler and rolled it against his forehead. Tastes awful, he said, but it's cold and wet. I'm guessing your mother intended to smuggle you out of there in a laundry truck. It's exactly what she was planning to do, Delilah confirmed. Unlike other women in that era, Mama knew how to drive. She was so bored and isolated as a teenager, she actually paid one of her father's delivery drivers to teach her how. So she put on a pair of sunglasses and a man's work jacket, tucked her hair under a hat, and I'll be damned if she didn't drive us right through the front gate without anyone even batting an eye. We were down the road and long gone before anyone even knew she was gone. Mom was hoping to take me out to her family's horse ranch in New Mexico, but the truck had other plans. We broke down on the side of the road just after sunset. 
We were way out in the middle of the desert, and there wasn't a single soul for miles. Mama sat behind the wheel for a while, with her head in her hands, and then she said, We're going to start walking, baby. We'll just pray the wrong person doesn't find us. Well, Mama never taught me anything about religion. That's why I didn't know what she was talking about. She told me praying is when someone asks a higher power to help them out during a rough time. I thought about it for a minute. So then I asked, Is there more than one higher power? Which one should I pray to? Mama just rubbed her eyes and said, I honestly don't know. Folks pray to a lot of different gods, and I don't know who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. Just pray for things to turn out, and maybe someone will hear you. Delilah pointed at Henry and asked, How about you, big brother? Do you pray to a god? Henry rubbed his chin thoughtfully and said, oh, Prayers are just hopeful thoughts, aren't they? Hoping for the best. I do that all the time. Delilah nodded thoughtfully and took another sip from her flask. It's an interesting take, Henry. I don't disagree with you. How about you, nephew? I shrugged and said, I have in the past. I'll probably do it again in the future. I'm not sure if there's a god or not, but can't hurt, right? I suppose not, Delilah conceded. But it might not help either. Anyhow, there we were. Stranded in the desert with bad people looking for us and nowhere to hide. So I did what Mama told me to do, and I prayed to a higher power. Lo and behold, just a little while later, we saw headlights pop up in the distance. Mama was scared it might be Father's henchman, but I assured her it was going to be just fine. I said, I prayed, and something listened, Mama. It's going to be okay. Pretty soon, an old stew baker came rattling into a stop on the road beside us. He was full of all these rough-looking people with dirty faces and wild, bushy beards. They all got out and stared at us with a look of fear and wonder on their faces. One of them stepped forward with his hat clutched in his chest and said, The scion and the mother walking along a dusty road beneath the desert moon. Saw it in my dreams many years ago, when I was still just a child myself. We've been searching for you for a long time, Mother. Praise him. The others repeated, praise him in unison. Their leader showed Mama the serpent tattoo on the back of his hand, and he asked, Mother, will you allow us to see the child's face? And Mama hesitated for a moment, and then she exposed my face to the moonlight. I was expecting them to scream, but that didn't happen. No, they started to laugh and sing praises to the heavens instead. They were overjoyed. The leader threw himself on the ground at my feet and cried like a baby. They weren't afraid of me. They, they worshipped me. They loved me with all of their heart and soul. They still do. Isn't that right, Diego? More than my own life, Diego breathed. His right cheek was twitching beneath the lens of his sunglasses and his lips were drawn together in a tight, bloodless line. He looked like he was either going to start bawling or lash out in a violent frenzy, maybe both at the same time. Henry's hand promptly dropped onto the gun in his lap and stayed there. Delilah patted her servant's knee and asked, "Would you kill for me, Diego? He automatically responded, Anyone, anywhere, anytime. Of course you would, Delilah chuckled. Would you die for me, though? Tell the truth. Diego promptly intoned in a strange, mechanical voice. It'd be the highest honor to die in the service of the madam. It seemed like he wasn't answering the question so much as he was reciting a line of scripture, often repeating and long committed to memory. I glanced over at Henry, and by the stunned expression on his face, I knew we'd come to the same conclusion at the same time. His long-lost half-sister appeared to be the leader of a bona fide death cult. Delilah slurped back the remains of whatever was in her flask and handed it over to Diego. She purred, go put this back for me, sugar, and then wait in the car. Get that air conditioning going, you hear? I'll be leaving soon. Diego stood up, cast one last menacing scowl at Henry and myself, 
and stalked back to the Mercedes with his hands clenched into fists. When he was out of earshot, she said, they took us back to their compound in the desert. We settled in and began our new lives as the scion and the mother. Of course, Mama didn't believe a single word of their holy rolling nonsense, but she understood that we had no choice but to play along. And after that, it felt natural. It felt right. Now, obviously, I don't believe I'm some sort of antichrist figure. Honestly, I'm just doing what I have to do in order to get by in this world. But it's awfully strange, isn't it? The effects of my condition match with their delusions almost perfectly. That young man's childhood premonition saved us that night. It brought us together. Like two lost pieces of a puzzle. When you throw that little prayer of mine into the mix, well, it's awfully strange. Yeah, that is pretty strange. Henry mused. Coincidences happen, sure. That's a pretty big coincidence. It's food for thought, Delilah murmured. When Mama passed away, I took on the name Madame Delilah to honor her memory. They just call me the Madam most of the time, and that's fine by me. I like my given name well enough, but the Madam just sounds so elegant, doesn't it? You know, if you don't mind me asking, how many people do you have in your... Uh, Congregation, Henry asked carefully. He had almost said cult, but he caught himself at the last instant. Well, when we first arrived at the compound, there was only 20 people in total, and that was including Mama and myself, but it wasn't long before new believers started trickling in. One, two, five, ten, more and more all the time. Today we're 10,000 strong. And we have congregations all over the country. Our flock is always growing. 10,000 will become 20,000, then 40,000. I reckon it won't be long before we step into the light and make ourselves known. But that time hasn't come just yet. It will come, though, gentlemen. It most certainly will. Henry took a long swallow from his beer and darkly muttered, You know, I'm kind of wishing this is the real thing right about now. Do you mind if I ask the name of your organization? What do these people even believe exactly? Delilah brightly chirped. I'm afraid we're not quite ready to reveal ourselves just yet, Henry. Without getting into particulars, our followers hold on to very strong opinions concerning the role of the serpent in the whole Garden of Eden affair. Let's just say, they're firmly on Team Serpent. And we'll leave it at that. Delilah let out a yawn and said, Well, Henry, I suppose I'll finish my story real quick and get out of your hair. Father pulled some strings and had Charlie's death declared an accident. He blamed me, of course, but I was only seven years old. I never intended to hurt anyone. I just wanted a friend. Every child wants a friend. Every child deserves a friend, Henry interjected. Children are born pure. They don't come into this world with hatred in their hearts. They learn it from their environment. Who is responsible for that? Well, us. That's who. Once again, I can't disagree, Henry. Anyway, father was granted a divorce from mama in absentia. And when enough time had passed, he had her declared legally dead. He was in a lot of hot water with all the indictments, but the state didn't do a very good job at protecting their witnesses. A bunch of them went missing, the rest of them stopped cooperating with the prosecution. Their case fell apart, and they were forced to let him walk. The review had closed its doors shortly after Mama disappeared. When Father was cleared of all charges, he had it demolished and fled the state. You know the rest of the story from there. Well, everything, except for the very end. See... I'd been secretly tracking the old goat for many years. I knew where he was, how much he was worth, and where he had hidden all his assets. I had a plan, and I waited until the time was right. When I learned Father was on his deathbed, I showed up at his door with a handful of legal documents and five of my most devoted acolytes. We forced our way in, and three of my followers detained his wife and the nurse who was doing Father's home care. 
They were too afraid to make much of a fuss. The rest of us trooped up to the second floor to pay Daddy Dearest a visit. It was the first time I'd ever seen him in real life. Just a pile of sticks at this point, all bones and hanging skin. I stood beside his bed and I asked him, Do you know who I am? He squinted up and he wheezed. You're the devil that stole my boy. I said, well, that's your opinion on the matter, isn't it? Now, allow me to tell you a fact, you horrible old bastard. You're going to sign each and every one of these documents, and I'm going to kill you. And that is not an opinion, dear father. It is a fact. Delilah tittered fondly at this memory, then added, He signed them, of course. Our patriarch wasn't a hero, not even on his deathbed. When he was done, I told the others to wait for me downstairs, and after they were gone, I leaned over him and said, You haven't seen my face since the night of my birth. I think it's time to take one last look at me, Father. Look at what you've created. I lifted my veil, and he died of heart failure on the spot. I didn't even need to touch him. It's almost kind of a letdown, to be honest. He just let out a gasp, and that was that. He was gone. Delilah gracefully flowed out her chair with a low groan, executing a big stretch skyward with unnervingly long arms. She looked down at us and said, It was amazing how quickly his widow stopped caring about his death after I told her about his hidden wealth. I took Father's nurse aside and explained she had two options. She could either receive $10,000 for her sworn discretion on the matter, or she could go for a car ride. She wisely chose the money. And with that, gentlemen, Delilah said briskly, my tale has concluded. The time has come for me to take my leave. I apologize for the intrusion, but I simply had to know if there was any other members of the family who suffered from my condition. I'm relieved to hear that I'm the only one. You would have had them killed, Henry said flatly. Isn't that right? You're the Messiah figure in a cult full of cutthroats and nutjobs. These cults. <laughs> Big money, aren't they? But sure they are. You can't risk having another Messiah pop up out of the blue. Not now. There's too much at stake. You have your sister killed too? Didn't want a living heir to come after you for the share of that estate. Bet you got rid of her a long time ago, didn't you? Delilah stared at him for a moment. Then she threw her head back and barked some cynical laughter at the treetops high above. She said, You are a cagey one, Henry. I'll certainly give you that. I'm very pleased to have met you, big brother. And before I go, I'd like to make you an offer. How about I buy the farm from these new folks and give it back to you? Free and clear, no strings attached. Would you like that? I choked on a mouthful of non-alcoholic beer and fell into a coughing fit. Henry, however, appeared to be unfazed by her offer. He burst his lips and said, People are awfully excited to start a new life here. Not sure if you'd convince them to sell. Oh, Diego's very persuasive, Lila countered. I think you could convince them to do just about anything I wanted. So what do you say, Henry? I promise to make it worth their while, and then it'll be yours again. You won't owe me a thing. Henry shook his head and said, No, thank you, ma'am. I don't want that. Your money is tainted, and frankly, so are you. I feel sorry for you, but uh, I don't like you. I don't want your charity. I just want you to leave. Delilah flapped her hand at him, a dismissive gesture, and she snapped, Very well then, Henry. I wish you all the best. I spoke up and said, Wait a second. Okay, it's none of my business, but I have to ask. What's in the flask? Delilah went silent, carefully considering her answer, and then she said, Over time, the Medusa disorder slowly changes your digestive system. I haven't been able to consume solid food in many years. I drink my nutrition instead. But what is it? I asked again and I could feel her malignant smile radiating its casual evil 
from behind the dark curtain of her veil. It made the hair stand up on my arms. She said, It's best if I keep that a secret for now. Just for now, though. Things will change. Remember, we're 10,000 strong and growing. Soon enough, it'll be 20,000. And then 40, and then... Well, who knows? The word of the serpent is spreading far and wide. In due time, we'll go public with our beliefs. And all your questions will be answered. Good day, gentlemen. Delilah turned and glided her way back to the waiting Mercedes. Diego jumped out and hustled to open her door before she got there. She turned back to look at us one last time before she left. And languid breeze gusted enough to make her veil swirl around in the wind. I was left with a quick impression of an elongated jaw that sloped into a disgustingly long neck. I saw a quick flash of wickedly sharp teeth and the glitter of yellow irises. It was just the briefest of glance, but that was enough to make my heart pound in my chest. We watched the Mercedes recede into the distance. When it was gone, I turned to Henry and said, Can you believe that just happened? Holy shit. Well, Henry drawled. I'll tell you something, kid. It's a big, weird, old world out there. We really don't know jack shit about it. All I can say for sure is that that cult's going to be a big problem someday. You watch and see. A few days later, I wandered into a variety store to pick up some lottery tickets, and I noticed a very familiar tattoo on the back of the clerk's hand. I wanted to mention it to him, but I had no idea what to say. After all, weren't they a secret organization, I thought? Hey man, I have a funny story for you. I actually met your messiah the other day. Turns out we're related, so can I maybe get a discount on these tickets? I decided to keep my mouth shut. And I headed for the door. As I was walking away, the clerk called out. The servant will return, brother. Believe it. I turned around and tried to think of a response. He saw the look at my face and said, Come on, I saw the way you looked at my tattoo. It won't be long before we can stop hiding in the shadows. There's more of us every day. Have a blessed night, brother. Delilah said they were 10,000 strong and steadily growing. As I drove home, I tried to imagine an alternate reality where a serpent-worshipping death cult ruled the world. With numbers like that, a highly organized mob of zealots could probably take control of an entire city. What if there was a hundred thousand of them? A hundred million? And Delilah would be at the helm of the ship, twisted by horrible misfortunes and driven by the thirst for revenge. Delilah, who so closely resembled their image of an unholy messiah. Delilah, with her poisonous touch and deadly venom. Henry was right. They could become a problem someday. A very serious problem. As Henry was fond of saying, it's a big, weird old world out there. We really don't know jack shit about it. What he doesn't mention is that sometimes it's a lot better that way. It allows us to get some sleep at night. For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to the stories, I'm going to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like, or there's Mr. Creepy Pasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. You can also ask for a dabbing sticker. If you ask her for a dabbing sticker, you get a special one that I made for her to use on that jar, and she told me not to use it. So I like telling you guys to go ask her because then you get a special one because then she's forced to admit that I made a really good concept, even though it's very silly. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea.
A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Buddy Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estabine, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Pikamel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Freddy Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Katie's Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.